our next speaker uh, spoke at the second Ignite we had way back in 2010 uh, when the world was young, um, Circle K was smaller. Um, he is a bookseller and his name is Garrett Scott. Please welcome him. Okay, so sex came to America in 1766. That year, the 28th edition of Aristotle's masterpiece, its frontispiece is seen here, though published with a London imprint, was in fact published by Zachariah Fallon, Boston. The book is neither by Aristotle nor is it a masterpiece, but it went through many editions and was the only book an early American would have read about sex. The masterpiece was first published in England in 1684 by physician William Salmon, who got to start jumping through hoops to attract crowds for traveling quacks. The masterpiece taught ordinary Americans about monstrous births, fertility, conception, childbirth, and it sometimes gave you a naked woman. It also suggested that sex might be fun. You and your partner should wind up your fancies to the highest pitch of desire. Note that this 1831 New England edition tried to stay current by adding Chang and Eng, the Siamese twins, who had first come to America on tour in 1829. But sex was becoming more scientific. Charles Knowlton, our nation's hottest medical reformer, was, he was one scientific doctor. He was jailed in Worcester, Mass. in 1829 after stealing a corpse for dissection. Uh, Knowlton became quietly radicalized and in 1832 published a tiny pamphlet called Fruits of Philosophy, the first contraceptive book by an American. It gave women reproductive control, providing formulas for contraceptive douches. Knowlton was prosecuted three times for obscenity. New York City abortionist Madame Restel, who was really named Anne Lohman, also gave women reproductive control. When she went to jail in 1847, her husband Charles Lohman first published this discreet little book, The Married Woman's Private Medical Companion by A.M. Marisot. Uh, Charles Lohman was Marisot. The book advertises abortion services and condoms. Anne Lohman killed herself in 1878 after prosecution for obscenity. A pregnancy was not the only consequence of sexuality. This 80, 1845 edition of Leopold Delon's Manhood suggests self-abuse is the cause. Uh, cold hip baths or leeches applied to your sexual parts are suggested as cures. Now this is the typical masturbator from Dr. Butts's Vadi Mecum, published in 1869. Note these sunken eyes and drooling mouth. Masturbation for both men and women sapped vitality and was supposedly fatal. Dr. Hyman A. Barrow in Brooklyn in 1869 here warned potential patients, there is nothing done in secret that shall not be revealed. The solitary vice entails upon its victims external marks. But more cheerfully, in 1874, Dr. Edward Bliss Foote published my favorite children's book, Science in Story, Sammy Tubbs, the Boy Doctor. A doctor adopts an African-American boy, Sammy Tubbs, and his troublesome pet monkey. He raises Sammy to be a lecturer in sexual physiology. Foote was a racial and a sexual progressive. The illustration of Sammy and his sweetheart marks the first positive illustration of an interracial kiss in American literature. But my favorite illustration is from the fifth volume. It's this, uh, and it's coming up here, it's this friendly vagina whistling a happy tune. <laughs> so later issues replace this image, but I forgive Foote because he was prosecuted by Comstock for obscenity in 1874. So after Comstock came to power as a postal inspector in 1873, American sex in print becomes encoded in the pressures of urban office life. 19th century penis pumps were marketed as of wonderful benefit to businessmen and office workers, invigorating and vitalizing the whole nervous system through increased circulation of the blood to the sexual organs. A vigorous penis would make you a more productive worker. Now, you could also get electrical belts at about the same time. They were popular for male weakness, and at best they were just a mild placebo that created a little tingle when you wore them. But competition among brands was scarce, because you, uh, was keen because you see lovely examples of design both in the catalogs and in the belts themselves. Now, the counterpoint to male debility for the American woman was hysteria. One doctor wrote in 1851, the hysterical paroxysm consists of sudden insensibility, laborious breathing, swollen neck, flushed cheeks, and a closed and trembling eyelid. And if you think this sounds a lot like the relief of healthy sexual function, you're right. Orgasms were therapeutic. Denied masturbation, a woman might seek treatment from a hydropathic physician. A jet of water played well on the loins, said one, tends powerfully to facilitate the uterine function. So high pressure hoses were not always convenient, so electrical massagers or vibrators later moved in marketed by catalogs as a healthful stimulation. The encoded language of convenience, privacy, and relief was suggestive. 
In any case, this model for the electric massager has the sexiest case of chest pains I've ever seen. <laughs> so the electric vibrator enlightening the world, that's where I want to end this talk tonight. Because <laughs> remember that America has always challenged access to information about sex and about contraception, but that America has always found a way to put it in the hands of people. And I hope that we can all carry on that work. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Garrett.